We're looking forward today to speaking to an actor who was as well known on TV screens as Steve Allen, Dinah Shore, or Dick Clark. And when your TV character name is right in the title of your TV show, it makes you one of the most memorable TV characters of all time. Thanks for joining us today. He's John Russell. I'm Rick Hickman. And here with us today is Jerry Mathers as the Beaver. Well, I don't know. That's such a great introduction. I, I, I think it might go to my head. But, you know, I had probably more fun doing Leave it to Beaver than you actually had watching it. Well, that's great to hear because that's exactly what we would have all hoped your history with the show was. And, of course, even before your TV career began, you were doing some other things in print and movies. And we'd like to have you tell us about some of those events and what sparked your interest or your parents' interest in having you perform in front of the camera. Well, to be honest with you, my parents really had no interest in it. My dad was from Iowa. My mom was from Minnesota. Um, under the GI Bill, my dad was a pilot during World War II and flew 25 missions over Germany and got the GI Bill. And so they moved out here so my dad could become uh, in, go into the school system. Um, he went to USC, so that's why they were out here. He was at school at the time and working part-time as a coach at a private school. But they didn't have a lot of money. I guess is what I'm trying to say. And my mom, when I was two years old, was at a department store looking for clothing for me. Uh, you know how two-year-olds grow. And a lady <laughs> came up to her and said, um, is this your little boy? And my mom, you know, it was the big city. And she said, yes, but she didn't know why the lady was asking. And she said, I wondered uh, if he, I noticed that he fits our clothes perfectly. He's just the right size. I wonder if he could be a model for us in our fashion shows. And my mom said, oh, well, I don't think so. No, no, no. And the lady said, but, you know, we could pay him, and he could keep the clothes. And my mom said, well, he could probably do that then. <laughs> and so that's how I started. But what a lot of people don't realize is at that time, all the TV shows, uh, except for the movies, were live. They weren't like they are now. Leave it to Beaver was on film, but these shows were all live. So my very first job at two years old, after I became a model, um, was to walk into a bar that um, was a western bar with all these cowboys fighting and breaking chairs over each other and one of the cowboys would pick me up and set me on the bar and i would pound on the bar and say i'm the toughest hombre in these parts and you better have my brand and then he would do a commercial for pet milk which was actually at that time baby formula all i had on for my first appearance on television was cowboy boots diapers six guns, and a 10-gallon hat. <laughs> There's a wardrobe but for you. Once, yeah, but once you did one of those right, I worked all the time because they couldn't afford to have a little boy that wa or girl that walked out there and saw it because it was in front of an audience, either panicked, forgot their lines, wandered off, you know, two-year-olds. Mm -hmm. So once I did it right, I worked all the time. And I was doing a, uh, another live show, and it was August, and it was very, very hot with all the lights, and they didn't have, they couldn't put on the air conditioning because it made too much noise. And I went out and I did my little scene, and then I walked back to my mom, and there was a drinking, um, one of the, like a sparklets type thing in the back of it. And I said, Mom, I need a drink of water. And she said, Shh. they told us to stand here and be quiet. Just stand here. This scene will only go on for a couple minutes or whatever, and then we can, we can go and you can get your drink of water. And this rather nice man walked over and said, don't worry, ma'am. I will get him a drink of water. And he walked me over, got me a drink of water, and then he went out and did some sort of a commercial. And about, oh, two or three weeks later, I got a call, went for an interview. There was that nice man. He says, hi, Jerry, my name is Alfred Hitchcock, and I want to know if you want to go to Vermont with me <laughs> for a movie. And that was the trouble with Harry. So it was just kind of things like that. It just kept kind of snowballing. I worked with Bob Hope. I did two movies with him. And most of the stuff I did, people don't even know because it was all live on television until I started Leave it to Beaver. Now, you mentioned Alfred Hitchcock. Of course, you worked with Bob Hope, James Mason, Frank Sinatra. You did some stuff with him, just some, some big names there. Now, you're just a, a kid at the time, so you can't really appreciate probably who these people are. But were your mom and dad saying, hey, you know, Jerry's working with Frank Sinatra or Alfred Hitchcock? I mean, were, were they kind of starstruck at all? A little bit, but, you know, at the time, I think it was just kind of normal. I know that sounds weird because I just told you that they were from Minnesota and, you know, <laughs> Iowa, but it was the kind of thing where they'd call me in, I'd go in. When I went for the interview for Leave it to Beaver, there were 5,000 people mm. on the interview, not all in Los Angeles. They interviewed like 1,000 or 1,500 in New York. 2,000 and then 3,000 here in Los Angeles, and it just wasn't for the part of the beaver. It was for all the kids, 
And that interview went on about six weeks where we'd go and we'd just stand there and they'd walk up and down a line and say, well, you two people stand together, you go read these lines. And they were looking, obviously, for brothers um, then they would and, and and other people, all the other characters. So we kept going back and back and back. And I had just joined the Cub Scouts, and my mom said, uh, "Oh, Jerry, good news! We got called back for that series." And I said, "Well, mom, I can't go." And she said, "What do you mean you can't go?" I said, well, "I have my first Cub Scout meeting today after school." And she said, "Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Well, you know, that's not till like an hour, an hour and a half after school. This isn't going to be like those other interviews. They're down to like the last maybe." eight or five kids or whatever it was. And so it'll just take a minute. They just want to see you one last time. And your meeting isn't until after, after school, so you'll be able to go to this interview and come back. I said, sure, I could do that. We got there. Of course, I was the last one in. And I'm the kind of guy that always likes to be on time, even back then. And so I was really antsy, and they knew me pretty well. So when I walked in and they said, Jerry, what's the matter? And I said, well, I really don't want to be here. And they said, well, why? I said, well, I have a Cub Scout meeting. And they said, okay, you can leave. So I walked right in and almost right out. And my mom said, Jerry, what happened? And I said, well, you know, they asked me if I wanted to be here. I said, I have a Cub Scout meeting. And they said I could leave. She said, well, Jerry, that's probably not the best thing to have told them because now they think you don't want the part. And I said, well, I want to go to my Cub Scout meeting. So I went. They called that night and said I had the job as the beaver because they'd rather have a boy that wanted to go to a Cub Scout meeting than be an actor. That's how I got the job. (laughs) Oh, man. Great story. (laughs) Then you started working in front of the camera on Beaver, of course. And when you and the other kids were on the set, was there an attempt to film all the scenes with you kids at one time so that you were on set as little as you needed to be? Well... Yes and no. Um, It was very tough on the adult actors because children can only work eight hours. So we would either work, and you have to go to school for three hours a day, and you have a private tutor and welfare worker who's the same person there monitoring how long you work. So she's not only your teacher, she's there all day to make sure that you only work the uh, the eight hours. What's that, Geraldine? Sounds like somebody calling outside. Mm, It's probably for Clarence. Hey, meathead! Meathead! Might be for you, dear. You know, it's it's um, the kind of thing where it's a lot of fun to be at, on a set, but for the adults it wasn't because we would shoot all the long shots and close-ups of the kids, and then we would finish by five, but they would have to go back to every set and re- and shoot the people, of the, the adults' close-ups, two shots, anything the kids weren't in. So they were there sometimes till 10 or 11 o'clock. We would work either from 8 to 5 or 9 to 6 as children, and then were sent home no matter where we were in the scene. Um, what was life like for you, Jerry, um, outside of, of the set? I mean, obviously it, it, it devoted a lot of your time. The series ran six years, um, but uh, obviously you, you, you went home and had a real life. I mean, were, were the kids kind of in awe of you being a, an actor? or what? what, what can you tell well, us a story about that? Well, you know, to be honest with you, I was working 39 weeks a year, and then we would go to New York for to meet the uh, uh, advertisers for about three weeks. Wow. And we'd go to Chicago. We would take about three weeks off, and we'd go right back into production. So there really wasn't a lot of t- a lot of time when I wasn't working at the studio. So your friends were really the the kids that surrounded you on the set. I would assume then, right? Yeah, well, you know, they were. We were, and you know, basically, I had what about. 90 or maybe 100 uh, fathers in some ways because all the people that were the grips, the cameramen, the lighting technicians, as I say, you can't make a kid work. So everybody, you know, they put up a basketball court and we'd all play basketball and throw baseballs around because if a child isn't happy, you can't tell them that you're going to sue them or whatever. They won't work. So everybody tried um, to make everybody happy, and ours was a very, very happy and and well-run set, and everybody liked going to work every day. Uh, Eddie Haskell, I, I think I saw an interview with you, uh, the Ken Osmond, who played Eddie Haskell. You said that uh, there probably wasn't a, a, a guy that was farther away from his character in, in real life. He was just kind of a, a sweet kid, I guess, and, and yet he plays this uh, kind of this rube <laughs> as far as, snarky. as, far as uh, well, yes, snarky hey. kid. Gee, Mrs. Cleaver, your hair looks nice. Thank you, Eddie. He, he is not what you'd call a sweet kid, but he is definitely an American (laughs) hero. Uh And people, when I tell them that, they say, how could Eddie Haskell be a hero? Well, Eddie Haskell would never be a hero. Ken Osmond, after he finished Leave it to Beaver, now when you look at him, you'll see that he's really skinny, and he always has. He Mm -hmm. uh, he just never put on any weight. 
he wanted to become a Los Angeles police officer. So very soon after finishing Leave it to Beaver, um, he turned, I guess it's 21, but I don't know what age it exactly was. But he went out to join the police force and um, became a police officer. And then he asked to be a motorcycle cop. And he's this little skinny guy, and he asked also to be sent to the worst part of L.A. at the time. It was a place where he said he saw at least three bodies every night. He was a motorcycle cop, so he was the first person to everything, because they can go in and out of traffic. Sure. And he, he saw uh, a guy steal a taxi cab, was chasing him. The guy jumped out of the cab and ran down an alley. Ken dumped his bike and was chasing the guy, and he said, I made a mistake. He said, I saw the guy running at full speed, and I didn't realize that he'd crotched down in this alley. So as Ken turned the corner, the guy shot him three times. Jeez. Luckily, he had a flak vest on. So the bullets, you know, but I didn't realize when you have a flak vest on, it's not like they just bounce off. They mm. go in, and he actually has three indentations in his chest mm. where these bullets actually hit and, like, separated a rib. And when he, uh, they then did catch the guy, and he's, he would actually had killed a couple people. See, he's now on death row. But Kenny, they told him, you know what? You've only got like two more years till you retire. Why don't we put you on a desk job and that way your pension will go up? And he said, Nope, I'm a policeman. I want to be on the streets. If you don't send me to the streets, retire me now. Hmm. And, you know, he's a police hero. He's just the greatest guy you'd ever want to meet. Great story about Ken. And, of course, you had a relationship with both your TV parents, Hugh Beaumont and Barbara Billingsley, and, of course, with Tony Dow. Let's talk about those folks and what they meant in your life. Well, Hugh Beaumont was very interesting because what he really was was a Methodist minister. And when he uh, graduated theological school, um, he needed a job where he could preach because he, had, he wasn't married at the time and asked for a very, very poor congregation. And, of course, when a minister asks for that, he gets it. <laughs> and he found his wife and got married and found and had, I think, at least one, but maybe two kids by that time, found that this, this, couldn't, this church couldn't support him and his family and so he needed a part-time job where he could still preach and, and do, you know, different services. So he became an actor. But his most famous character before Leave it to Beaver was Michael Shane. Now, if you've ever seen a Michael Shane TV show, Michael Shane is a very, very hard drinking, always has a bottle of bourbon in his pocket. When he wants information from a bad guy, he just takes him and pounds him up against the wall. Nothing uh, a minister would ever want to be known for, <laughs> but he was doing it, and he did raise his family. So when he got the part and leave it to beaver i think that's what people really see i mean they say oh he was so good at telling you this and that well that was the minister in in him coming out and he was just so good at it how's the other kid look all right all right well you you must have got in a couple of good licks didn't you no sir you you mean you didn't fight back no sir well what did you do you must have done something i ran away you ran away Ward, you're frightening him. Well, it frightens me a little, too. A boy <laughs> running away. Beaver, go ahead and eat your soup. I don't want to. What's the matter? I'm gonna be sick. I think he is. Remember on the roller coaster when he... Never mind. <laughs> Beaver, you can't be sick. I think I can. Beaver, you run along upstairs. Wally, you go along with him. I'll bring you up trays later. Do you have a bad day at the office today? Oh, no. No, not at all. <clears throat> well, there was a little upset over the Thompson deal. They uh, can't decide who to give it to. It'd be either Fred or me. Why don't you fight him for it? <laughs> um, Barbara Billingsley was a very, very um, uh, wealthy, uh, uh, basically, New York model. Um, when she did leave it to Beaver, and people always say, well, how come she always had the pearls on? What was that about? Well, the thing was, Barbara, like the models today, was very, very skinny, and the two muscles in her neck, um, right above where a man has his voice box, um, made a shadow because she was so skinny that when they lit her, it, it made it look like she had a tracheotomy or some kind of a, a black spot there, and the only kind of jewelry that they could think of that she could wear all the time and it wouldn't be odd, were pearls. So that's why Barbara always wears those pearls in every shot. It's to hide the little shadow that her neck muscles made. 
we talk about the, the television, well, society in general at the time that Leave it to Beaver was on. And I think back to the Lucy show and, and all the shows back then where you had the couple sleeping in separate beds even and things like that. And the Leave it to Beaver show was revolutionary in breaking some of the, I don't know, some of the, the well, I, I'm thinking of the uh, the alligator scene. Yeah, and I know show, what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, t- tell us about. You're talking uh, about the, the very first show we ever did on Leave it to Beaver was guess what? Banned from television. <laughs> wow. You'll say, how could a Leave It to Beaver be banned? Well, the very first show at that time in the front and back of comic books on like the, the, that first page, you could send to Florida and get a live alligator sent to you. And Wally and the Beaver want a, a pet, and the parents say, no, you won't be able to take care of it. You know, you're, you're not you know, responsible enough to have a pet. So Wally and the Beaver, being the people that they are, find this comic book and send away to Florida for an alligator. And they're not going to tell their parents. They're going to show them that they could raise it, and they didn't even know it was there because we took such good care of it. So when the alligator comes, they have it says in the, the instructions, they need water. And so Wally and the Beaver decide to put it in the toilet in their bathroom, in the toilet tank, because it says it needs a little place to sit in water. The boys, they're upstairs in their room. I think they're sending away for something again. Cutting out box tops? Well, they borrowed one envelope, one three-cent stamp, and a pair of scissors. Well, whatever they're doing, it's probably childish, but uh, harmless. Raise an Everglades alligator in your own home. Express charges prepaid. Live delivery guaranteed. No CODs. Wally, we can keep in the bathtub. Well, okay, let's send for it. But an eight-foot alligator for only two dollars and a half... There must be a catch to it. But Wally, they wouldn't let him print it robot men on Mars unless it was the truth. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. Well, at that time, men and women weren't allowed to sleep in the same bed. If a woman was in bed and a man couldn't sleep in it, he could he had to have at least one foot on the floor if he even talked to her, and bathrooms were totally out of bounds. They couldn't be shown, not even Anyway, so Leave It to Beaver's first show was banned because we had a toilet. What they did was they negotiated with the Hayes Commission and said that they could just show the top of the toilet tank with the alligator swimming around in it. And that's so Leave It to Beaver was the first show on television to have a bathroom. Man. In fact, the Brady Bunch didn't even have it <laughs> later. They always combed their hair in front of the room in the, in the bedroom. <laughs> and then, of course, in most scenes, I would imagine you were paired with Tony. A lot of them we were. You know, Tony and I had a lot of good scenes. And, you know, the the writers between them had, and I think it was 14, but it may even have been 15 kids. Um, so they knew how kids talked. Uh, Joe Conley and Bob Mosier were the, the head writers and producers. And they knew the kind of things that kids did and all the stories, as I told you, from Leave to Beaver from real life. So it was, you know, really pretty easy. Now, Tony himself, uh, you, you mentioned about how you auditioned, and they said we'd rather have a real kid, a kid that wants to go to a Cub Scout meeting as opposed to be an actor. Now, Tony himself was not an actor. He was just a an All-American kid. He was an athlete, and, and, and so all of a sudden that kind of just bought into that whole thing of, you know, we we just want real kids in this, right? Well, that was the thing. Uh, in fact, Tony wasn't the original Wally. If you watch the pilot, um, Hugh Beaumont, the only people from it were um, Barbara Billings and myself. They replaced the father with Hugh Beaumont, and they also replaced the Wally kid. But the reason they replaced the Wally kid was he was about five, probably five five when we did the pilot. But he got a growth spurt, and he was 6'3", and he was actually taller than Hugh Beaumont when we went back to do the pilot. I mean, when we get, went back from the pilot to do the regular show. So they went out, and they had interviewed all kinds of kids. Tony had never worked as an actor. Since he was two years old, he'd been training to be an athlete, and he had started out in gymnastics, and he was training for the Olympics. He wanted to be an Olympic diver and gymnast. Um, and so he walked in, and they said, well, he's the perfect actor for the part because they wanted a person that was an actor, but he'd never acted. And so that was really his first job as an actor. And he's now a very, very successful director and actor. So it was a, a good move for him, I think. You know what this is? It's whiskey. Smells awful. Well, all whiskey smells awful. Then why do people drink it? Well, uh, it's like when grown-ups have a party. They drink it to have a good time. Gee, if it's a party, don't they have a good time anyway? 
Well, grown-ups have a harder time having a good time than kids do. You mentioned that it was always fun on the set, and of course the show began in 57 on CBS, jumped to ABC, and ran for many years following that. How often and with whom might it, you have crossed paths from other TV shows airing at the time? Well, you know, as I say, I've worked with Hitchcock, um, so he was always on the lot because he was doing Alfred Hitchcock Presents then. So he'd always drive by in his big, like I guess it was a Rolls Royce, but it was a big black car with a chauffeur, and he'd roll down the window and go, Hello, Mr. Mathers, because he always <laughs> called me Mr. Mathers. Um, and that was really weird because my dad was Mr. Mathers. But, you know, working at a studio is just so much fun because well, on, on his movie Psycho, um, I don't know if you will remember this one, but one of the very first Leave It to Beavers, I lose my money for a haircut, and I have to, and I try to cut it myself, and then Wally helps me. But because of that, they couldn't cut my hair because the shows weren't shown in order, so they had to get me like a the best makeup man in the business to make me a hairpiece, and he became our makeup man for the first year because the makeup men love to work on a series because they get 39 weeks of straight work, and this guy was one of the top people. In, um, in Hollywood to make things for movies. And so when Hitchcock wanted to do Psycho, he's the guy that actually made the um, skeleton look old and put the hair on it. And I got to actually put a lot of the hair on the Psycho mother when they turn it around. Because what is more fun for a kid than seeing a real human <laughs> skull and getting to put hair on it? Yeah, so it was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. The show had its run of six years. It seems much more than that because it's it's forever uh, seen in syndication and and, and reruns. And I got to ask you the question. I think I know the answer, but uh, do you get a piece of the action, you guys, uh, from from any residuals at all? No, we were paid for the first six times, but it's very very good. We thought we were in hog heaven because just basically, I think it was fifty three or fifty four. We started in. 57 mm -hmm. actors were only paid for the one time so when you were paid for six and i'll tell you the truth it was on a declining scale so the first time you got like maybe 80 percent uh. but by the last time you were getting maybe you know like 20 percent now it's on that same kind of a schedule so i sometimes get residuals for shows i've done after leave it to beaver of course and they're like for 15 cents 20 cents because mm -hmm. it's shown so many times right. so it's not like i'm losing a fortune <laughs> and the the last show that ever aired was was really kind of a sweet show in terms of it was a, a looking back show. I think you had the scrapbook there, and you were uh, you know, they, right. they they pieced in all the uh, old episodes. At that time, though, as you look back on it, was everybody ready for the series to to end? I mean, you'd done it for six years. That's a that's a lifetime in in television. Were, were people ready to move on at that point? Well, I think we were, you know, and the reason they did that one is because they wanted to have a huge party, and so that one was much, we only shot that for one day, so they had the entire budget for the other two days in the rehearsal, so that's why that show was like that, because and we had a, a, a great party, but yeah, after six years, um, in Hollywood at that time, that's what a contract could be signed for, so they would have had to come back and renegotiate all the contracts, and, you know, they just didn't want to go through that hassle, they said, we've got this six years of a great show let's all walk away from it and everyone walked away happy no one it's not that we didn't want to go back but we were happy that the show was good and we knew it was going to go into syndication hey who's coming to your party oh, just some of my friends bet you're having something else besides fellow friends <laughs> what are you driving at i'll bet you're having girlfriends too <laughs> what of it gee wally uh... I don't know why you guys would want to go spoil a neat party for it by having girls. <laughs> oh, I don't think they'll spoil it too much. Yeah, I guess if you guys want an Indian wrestle or crack your knuckles, you can go in the kitchen. And I know, you know, obviously you were typecast a bit as a beaver, as were, was everybody in the show, but I think I saw an interview with you where you said, you know, I was ready to go to school. I just wanted to uh, carry on with, well, it, with a normal yeah. life. People said, why didn't you work after Leave it to Beaver? Did, you know, did, were you too well known? No, I turned down. In fact, the, they had another series that they wanted me. I would have been a pilot. I don't know if it would have sold. But I had never been to regular school. I had had a private tutor since the first grade. It was actually a movie. And then I went right into Leave it to Beaver. So I had never been in school with other kids. And it was my freshman year in high school. And my dad retired as a superintendent of L.A. City Schools. But when he started, he started at a 
a parochial school, and I had gone there when I was like two and three to all their carnivals and things when he was a coach there. So I wanted to go to Notre Dame High School and play sports, which was the other thing I couldn't do when I was working at the studio. And my parents said, do you want to go? This is, I said, no, I want to go to regular school. They said, fine. I started school. I spent four years in school. Um, when I graduated, it was like 67, and I spent six years in the Air Force. And then I'd always wanted to go to college. I went to Berkeley. I have a degree in philosophy from Berkeley. I'd used the money from Leave It to Beaver to put myself through school. And the banker that I was investing with said, you know, you've taken your money. You've handled it very well. How would you like a job with the bank? Because you'll know more about money and business than they'll ever teach you at school. And I said, fine. I was a banker for a couple of years. I became a loan officer. I was making huge loans and saying, this person is making this commission, and this is my check for the week. Uh, that's a lot more money. I went into real estate, and then Tony Dow was going to do a play in Kansas City, and he said to me, you know, you're in real estate, and there's a lot of real estate in Kansas City. And I looked it up, and it was a lot cheaper than the ones in L.A., and my investors <laughs> didn't care where a medical office building was. Yeah. So then I did a play with Tony. We traveled for almost a year to sold-out audiences, when we came back to Los Angeles, the people here said, if they're that popular doing a play that's not Leave it to Beaver, let's do the movie of the week. And that's how the new Leave it to Beaver started. Man. And, of course, you were such a part of uh, urban legends, too. I mean, the Vietnam War coming up at that time, and there was always the, the legend out there that Jerry Mathers was killed in the, in the Vietnam War. Uh, uh, can you talk well, to us I about that? because people saw me in the service, and I wasn't really out there working, so they saw that I joined the service and didn't hear anything else about it. And I think that's why they said, oh, he must be dead, because we don't hear anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's nice. <laughs> Anybody call you up and say, hey, Jerry, you're supposed to be dead? <laughs> a lot of people did, actually. In fact, Ken Osmond called my mom, um, wow. at the guy who played Eddie Haskell, and, and told her how sorry he was. Oh, he gosh. knew that I was in, you know, in the service and thought that I probably had really died. And she yeah. said, no, 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 he's, he's here. He's just in that, you know, it, somebody saw the same name. I, I tried to find out how it happened. They said either someone with the same name or a similar name, and they didn't do the background check. They just saw the name and ran the story, and everybody picked it up. Sure. Well, your parents are to be commended because, and you know this more than I do, that the sad stories of childhood actors who, uh, you know, they hit it big for a while, and then all of a sudden the family kind of just lives off in them, and they're the gravy train, and then it all stops, and everybody's uh, everybody's broke. But your your family had the foresight to say, hey, this is Jerry's money, we're putting it away, and, and then you were able to parlay that into some, some successful career. So, yeah, I mean, obviously you've seen some sad stories uh, of, of the kids that, that didn't make it, right? All right, yeah, and, but you know, my parents were the perfect parents to raise a child on TV because my dad was uh, a vice principal and a principal of the largest high school, but he was dealing with the best of kids but the worst of kids. Mm -hmm. So he knew when I was, you know, normal, deviant teenage behavior or when I was off the track, and every year the senior class would present the junior class with a brand new wood paddle because they, at that time, paddled kids. And uh, um, if my dad would give them a choice, if you did something wrong at his school, you could either take a SWAT or you could call your parents. He said most of the kids at that time took a SWAT. <laughs> but that paddle every year, the one that had been used the year before, came home. So I got a taste of that paddle myself a few times. Oh, Lord, can, can you imagine what he's gone through for the last few weeks? Just so you'd still be proud of him? Yep. You know something, June? We'd be a lot better parents if we didn't wait till they did something good to let them know we're proud of them. Every once in a while, just for no reason at all, we ought to tell them we love them. Well, one of the jobs that you had was a caterer, um, and uh, that kind of uh, led to what uh, you're passionate about now. And I don't, I'm not talking about food necessarily, <laughs> but, but it actually led well, to, yeah, to a very serious disease. Well, that's true, because I had several businesses, as I, as I was telling you, and one of them was a catering business. But when you're a caterer, you take your food out. And we were doing studios uh, catering, so it was for movies and television. So what you do is you go and you meet the producers and the directors and sometimes some of the stars of these different shows, and you show them all your food, because you may be serving them for 30 or 40 days. So you bring quite a bit of food and everybody eats. But I was seeing probably 10 to 15 of these people a day, and if you don't eat your own food, they go, what's the matter that you're not eating? eating your food and you want us to eat it. So I put on about 60 pounds and I have a very, very good friend that's a doctor. And she said to me, you know, Jerry, you need, you put on a little weight. You ought to come in for a physical. And I said, oh, I feel fine. And I looked around me and everybody was overweight. And she just kept bothering me. But she's a personal friend uh, of the family too. So at Christmas, she said, oh, Jerry, I have a, a Christmas present for you. I'm going to give you a free physical. And I said,
said, that would be great. And she said, okay. Um, I went in, took the physical, went back, and she said, how would you like to see your kids grow up? Hold your grandbabies, do this, do that. The other thing she said, if you don't do something about your diabetes, I said, diabetes? She said, you'll be dead in three to five years. Wow. And you could have knocked me over with a feather. Um, I looked around, and everybody was, you know, I thought, as you know, had weight like me. And so I took off the weight. It took me about seven years. I'm now, um, you know, actually about 160 pounds, where I was like almost, uh, you know, 240, 250 for a while. I'm now pre-diabetic, and I speak all over the country because diabetes is at a record numbers all over. It's an epidemic, and a lot of people don't even know that they have, um, they're either pre-diabetic or diabetic because they've got too much weight. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and the thing that's, I know my wife is a type 2, and the thing that's so, exactly. so dangerous about that is, as you said, I mean, you're, you're tooling along, and you really don't notice any difference in your life. And, uh, and if, you don't, uh, if you don't get that taken care of, you're going to have some big, big problems. Absolutely. People just don't understand that, that you, you make these little energy, all the food you eat, that's what diabetes is. You make energy pellets, and they're what drives your body and makes your muscles move. And your liver makes a thing that in, encapsulates these energy packets. And they go through your body, and they deliver it to the muscles, and everything's fine. If you eat too much, your liver can't make enough glucose, which encapsulates them. And because of that, these little energy pellets hit other things. And because of gravity, they usually go to your feet. That's why uh, they start, I hate to say this, but they start amputating your toes because these energy pellets hit the toes, burn it, and then after a while, as I say, that's why a lot of diabetics um, start losing limbs. But it's a nasty disease. You can't always cure it like I did by losing the weight. I caught mine early enough, but you can lead a much better life. And even if you have to take insulin, it's much better than not being around. Are there some general warning signs, Jerry? I mean, obviously you said, you know, you were tooling along and didn't catch I, it, but are, are there some, some signposts that you might be headed down that road? Probably, probably if you're more than 25 to 30 pounds over your ideal weight, and everybody always says, well, you know, I'm big boned or I'm whatever, <laughs> but you probably should go in, and it's a very simple test. All they do is they prick your finger with a very, very small little needle and take a, and they run your, uh, a blood test on you, and that'll tell you how many of those things are floating around that aren't encapsulated, how many of those little energy pellets are doing damage to your body instead of helping you think and move. And you, you're obviously talking about that. You're also still active in, in, in acting. Um, your hairspray, you, you went on Broadway with that. So you're still, uh, you're still doing some odds and ends as far as in front of the camera, in front of the audiences, aren't you? Oh, very definitely. In fact, that you know, for an actor, I have done everything. I've, I've been on a major TV series. I've been in major movies with major directors. I'm also a licensed like you guys. I'm a licensed DJ. I've had my own radio show. So, you know, I've, I've covered just about all the bases and had a great time doing it. Life has been very, very good to me. Well, it sounded like a great career until you talked about that radio DJ <laughs> stuff. And we, we know no, that at the time you I really had... hit the skids. Yeah. No, I had a great time. A very good friend of mine was a, a, a program director at a radio station out here in L.A., and he said, how would you like to do an overnight? Because my guy's sick. He called me up. I did it. He said, I will offer you Friday and Saturday night for as long as you want to do it. And I did it for about a year. It was a clear channel, so it was not only just in the little area. It went all across the United States, and I'd have people calling in. Had a wonderful time. And uh, it was actually when I started doing the new Leave it to Beaver that I pretty much had to quit that job because I've been working full-time again. Mm -hmm. So was it, was it a regular show show, or was it, hey, this is Jerry yeah, Mathers with my... Go ahead. Yeah, but it's called Jerry Mathers Gathers with Rock and Roll for the Mind, Body, and Soul. Wow. I played rock and roll and took people's questions, and as I say, just had a great time. And being a clear channel, I would get people all across the United States, Canada, and other places. So it was really a fun time for me. I'd be pretty bad the next Monday or uh, Sunday morning, but uh, aside <laughs> from that, by Monday or Tuesday, I'd recover. That sounds like a blast. Final question here for you, Jerry. We'll let you know you've been more than gracious sure. with us here. Um, you've had, you have kids yourself, and has there been any uh, attempt by them to say, hey, I'd like to get into to acting? And, and if so, or if not, uh, your reasons for, for where they're at? <laughs> well, they they didn't particularly want to get into acting, so we didn't do it, but two of my children are, um, are in the industry. My daughter is in HR with Burnham Murray, who is the people that do, like, Project Wenry and all of the reality shows. Sure. My son is a, is a sound man, and he's right now doing, um, 
I think it's called Coast Guard Alaska, so he's up there. And my other daughter has just got her master's, and she works. Uh, she wants to follow in my dad's uh, footsteps, and she works in the uh, uh, school system here. So I have three great kids, and they're all doing very wonderful things. I don't know how I got so lucky. Man. What a great legacy, not only your TV life, but obviously in parenting. And you've seen good parenting from your own to Barbara and Hugh, right on now following down to your own kids. That is really a superior mm-hmm. legacy right there. You know what? I just got very, very lucky, I think. Uh, you know, I've had a, a wonderful life, and it's just, you know, and a lot of it wasn't planned. It just I was in the right place at the right time a lot of times, and so life has been very, very good to me. You have a great website. I know we want to plug that. I mean, it's some fantastic information sure. on there, and also, you know, how people can uh, maybe get your services if there's an appearance, or certainly if they want you to talk on, on diabetes. Can you can you kind of give us uh, that, sure. that, that, that stuff? Well, well, if you want to find out just generally about Leave it to Beaver and all the other people, I have a website, which is jerrymathers.com, and that just tells you where I'm doing and what I'm doing. But you can also reach me on Twitter or Facebook, but on those, it's the Jerry Mathers, because I wasn't quick enough to jump in and get Jerry Mathers. So. But you can write me, and I'll answer you back if you have a question that you guys didn't ask me today, or you want to you know, find out something, either Twitter or Facebook. And if you want to know more generally about all the places I'm going and things that I'm doing, which I do mention on Twitter, but and Facebook, but you can really see what's going on on thejerrymathers.com. Well, Jerry, it just means the world to us that you're able to spend so much time with us this Saturday morning, and thanks for all the joy you've brought to our TV screens. We're so happy to hear that you've had a good life. There's nothing more than we would have expected or want to hear about the beaver. Thanks so much for joining us, and of course, we'll look forward to our next Legends segment in the near future here on the Saturday Morning Jukebox with John and Rick. 